I want to uh, welcome everybody to the third of Foster's Lunch and Learn webinars. My name is Andrew Kruger, and I am part of the school's alumni engagement team. Um, I am sporting my new uh, COVID uh, hairstyle, courtesy of my uh, eight-year-old daughter today, so I'm feeling fresh. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Andy Haffenbrack. Uh, originally from Issaquah, Washington, he received his BS in decision making and I believe a minor in music from Carnegie Mellon University and his PhD from INSEAD. He joined the Foster School last year and currently teaches management and leadership and mindful decision making in our evening MBA program. His research in microorganizational behavior and the psychology of management addresses questions ranging from when mindfulness meditation can be used to influence organizationally valued outcomes uh, to what the implications of multicultural experiences are for individuals' career trajectories and creative abilities. His research has been published in a multitude of top journals, uh, including the Organizational of Organizational Behavior and Human Decision Processes and the Journal of Applied Psychology, and in popular media outlets such as The Atlantic, The Financial Times, Forbes, The New York Times, and many more. Andy, thank you for joining us today. Wow, thanks Andrew for such a nice introduction. Thanks Andrew and Kristen for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here. So today I'm very excited to be sharing some research with you guys on a topic that's near and dear to my heart, mindfulness meditation and how it can be used or how it manifests in the workplace. This was the topic of my dissertation. And so where mindfulness started was about 2000 years ago in the Pali Canon of Theravada Buddhism in India. And for most of the time since then, it consisted of these philosophical considerations, like what's the right thing to do? How should you treat other people? How we should be aware of the downstream outcomes of our behaviors? And mental training exercises or meditations, which were meant to focus the mind and help support the philosophies, the philosophical considerations. So it's kind of a package. Then about 50 years ago, a bunch of Western contemplatives like Jack Kornfield, John Kabat-Zinn, Mirabai Bush, they liked mindfulness and they wanted to bring it to the West. But they knew that people in the US, for example, weren't really looking for a new religion. So they needed to secularize it for it to have more mass appeal. So they took away the hand decorations and these hand mudras, they're called. They took away the traditional robes. They took away guru worship and these kind of artifacts or trappings that feel really religious, but they also changed the content. So they took away the philosophical considerations or really toned them down a lot, and they ended up teaching the meditations alone in isolation. So when you see people meditating at the World Economic Forum, they're not listening to someone tell them, oh, here's how you should treat everyone, here's how you should treat all sentient beings, here's the right thing to do. They're just listening to someone guide them through a probably body awareness meditation to help them reduce their anxiety, stress, or depression. Um, and then they're probably going to go on to doing their work just like anyone in their field would do their work. So there are many different mindfulness programs. I saw a statistic that about 65 to 70 percent of Fortune 500 companies have some kind of mindfulness facilitating program for their employees. So it's easier at this point to list the ones who don't have a mindfulness program of some sort than it is to list the ones that do. But just some of the really important ones I've top of my head would be Google, General Mills, the Seahawks, um, and various different parts of the US military. And then there's a company called the Potential Project that instead of um, having companies build their own mindfulness program from the ground up and needing to hire um, mindfulness coaches and what have you, the Potential Project, they can hire the Potential Project and they'll come in and do um, these mindfulness programs that are really ready-made for the workplace and they have offices in many cities throughout the world. So one of the really famous proponents of mindfulness is this neuroscientist named Richard Davidson. And he admits that there is a really important role for science to play in the promotion of mindfulness in Western cultures. So he's been quoted saying, there's a swath of our culture who is not going to listen to someone in monk's robes, but they are paying attention to the scientific evidence. So what's mindfulness and meditation? Mindfulness meditation is this practice of cultivating present moment awareness, often by focusing attention on the physical sensations of breathing 
or physical sensations of walking or eating or focusing on different parts of our body in succession in a body scan, or it can consist of noticing our emotions or our thoughts as they arise, but often with a more detached outlook. So the difference between I'm angry, like I identify with it and it's who I am, or I notice I'm feeling anger right now, where it, you're still acknowledging the anger, but from a little bit more of an observer perspective. And it can also be about noticing the, the sounds or the sights or the other sensory experiences around you in the moment. So mindfulness as a psychological concept is this state that people go into when they've meditated, where they're present moment aware, they're feeling more non-judgmental or accepting towards stimuli in their life, uh, and they tend to also be a little bit calmer. Um, and so mindfulness is not only something that comes up after meditation, it can also spontaneously come up in other situations. Uh, it's more likely to come up if we've gotten enough sleep, it's less likely to come up if we have a smartphone around that can draw our attention away from what else is going on. Um, but the main way that we study it and the main thing that's known to put us into this state of mindfulness is mindfulness meditation. And the main way that people tend to get into mindfulness or the main program length or program format is this eight week mindfulness training program uh, that the most famous of which is called mindfulness-based stress reduction, which was created by John Kabat-Zinn. And the idea of these eight-week training programs is that you meditate about 45 minutes every day for about eight weeks, uh, maybe six days a week. And the reason you do this is to increase your trait mindfulness, which is how much you're habitually focusing non-judgmentally on the present moment, even when you're not meditating. The idea is that you're kind of building this metaphorical muscle where you are able to focus more in the present moment and reconnect with the present moment more easily because you've built this skill through practice. And so there are a lot of different benefits we know of from increasing our trait mindfulness or having higher trait mindfulness. It tends to reduce our negative emotions or these correlates of negative emotion like depression, anxiety, anger, and stress. It reduces rumination, which is how much we're playing back these negative things that happened in the past over and over in our mind, often in kind of ways that just make us feel bad without really helping us. Um, and it reduces how much we overuse drugs or how much people's minds wander away from the task at hand. And it also increases our psychological functioning and how well people can perform on things like GRE tests, which is important because it determines who gets into graduate schools. And it also helps people have more self-control and impulse control. So there are a lot of things we know about that mindfulness does, and the vast majority of them are positive. And there, again, is this difference though between the trait and the state. The trait of mindfulness, <clears throat> it's more stable. It's how much do you focus on the present even when you're not meditating and it just changes your general mental routine or even changes your personality in some sense. Whereas a state of mindfulness is much shorter. It might only last uh, a few minutes or maybe it lasts an hour. Um, but it's a lot easier to put yourself into. All it takes is one meditation and you get into this shorter term state of mindfulness. And this is the focus of my research because many people, especially in white collar jobs, they already feel like they don't have enough time to do the things they already need to do. So they have, they have what's called time famine, according to Leslie Perlo at Harvard. And so I was interested in this question of when and why is a state of mindfulness helpful or harmful because people could meditate in specific situations in the workplace when it would benefit them or when they really need it um, without necessarily having to invest 45 minutes of every day into it if that's not something that they think they can do depending on their life situation. So the way I've been studying this has been mostly by running these little experiments where we randomly assign people to listen to a 15 minute mindfulness meditation recording where they listen to a professional mindfulness coach guide them through the process of a meditation where they focus on the physical sensations of breathing and are told, you know, if your mind wanders away, don't judge yourself, just bring your attention back to the breath. Um, so it's either the mindfulness condition like that, or uh, they might be randomly sorted into a control condition where they read the news or they write about the past or they listen to a recording made by a mindfulness 
coach as well, but it just tells them to think whatever comes to mind. So it tells them basically to mind wander and that's not a form of meditation. And then after they've been put into one of these groups and they do the mindfulness or control task, we see what that did to the next questions we ask them or the next task we give them um, because it's a carryover effect. The state of mindfulness they were put into is going to influence, it's gonna continue to the next thing or the next few things that they're gonna do. And in terms of the effects of this short term state of mindfulness, we also know quite a bit right now, uh, but it's a very recent body of work. Nearly all of it's coming in the last, I don't know, six, six to eight years. So we know that it reduces negativity bias, which is the tendency for us to overweight negative information over positive information when we're forming an attitude. It reduces our state negative emotions and our feelings of emotional exhaustion. And it also reduces rumination. So playing back the bad things of the past, and there's one study that found that it reduces retaliation towards injustice. And what that meant was that they brought people into the um, laboratory and the experimenter told them, here's a, here's a pen that you can use. And it was a really nice pen. And this can be your gift or your reward at the end of the study. You can keep it. Then maybe 20 minutes later in the study, the experimenter came back and said, oh, actually, uh, I we're actually short on these pens, so you can't keep it. I changed my mind. And what they found was that the participants who had meditated were in the mindfulness condition, they were less likely to steal the pen from the laboratory than people who were in the control condition. And so you could say, well, maybe it's a good thing that they're standing up for themselves. Maybe it's a bad thing that they're stealing. That's the form they're standing up for. But in any case, that was the effect. And so mindfulness also reduces aggression and these age or race biases that we have sometimes uh, in as measured by the IAT, the Implicit Associations Test. And then it can increase people's resilience or their ability to continue focusing on these kind of distressing pictures uh, and sustain their focus on whatever other task at hand they might have. It increases our sleep quality and also the quantity. It helps people get to sleep and helps them stay asleep. It also improves people's reading comprehension and makes them more satisfied with their jobs. So there are also a lot of things we know about the effects of state mindfulness and the vast majority of them are also positive. Um, so I got interested in studying mindfulness because at the beginning of my PhD program, I was really overwhelmed and stressed out because I felt like I didn't have enough time to do the amount of research I needed to do in order to publish in these journals everyone respects uh, before I had to go on the job market at the end of my fourth year. So I felt like I was so stressed out that it was making me perform worse. It's and even making me make a little bit worse decisions. And I thought, well, maybe I'm not alone in this. And maybe if there was some way to make myself calmer, um, it would help me make better decisions and maybe it would help other people too. So I started meditating. I felt like it helped. And then I started running studies to see if it would help other people. And we found that it did for one form of decision-making, which is called the sunk cost bias. The sunk cost bias is this tendency for us to invest money, effort, or time into something just because we've already invested money, effort, or time in it. So it's this challenge we have cutting our losses or admitting we're wrong when we made an investment that we're starting to learn is going to go south. Um, and so mindfulness helped people cut their losses sooner or in that way make better or more rational decisions rather than committing the sunk cost bias in the series of studies we ran. So this was my first publication in February of 2014 and it was really good timing to publish this topic at that time because that was kind of the high watermark of popular interest in mindfulness in at least America, if not the West. So here was the uh, time cover story of that same month, which was called the Mindful Revolution. It was documenting all of these benefits of mindfulness for people's personal and professional lives. And because our timing was kind of so good, we got a lot of press ourselves, including five separate articles in the Huffington Post talking about our one scientific article. So they really kind of went to town on this. Um, and people were also using mindfulness to sell stuff. It was so popular that they were like, okay, let's leverage this for merchandising. So here is a clothing company called Best Dressed Monk from Northern California. I, I don't think they're still with us, but they really were a real company for a few years. Uh, from like 2013, 2016, or 17. Uh, their tagline was attire for the mindful man. Here is mindful mayo, which you could or maybe still can buy in grocery stores. And just to give you an idea of how many different kinds of organizations were jumping on the bandwagon, you could do goat yoga at a series of farms throughout the country, this one in New Hampshire. I think it's important to note that this 
uh, is a farm that added the yoga, not a yoga studio that added the goats. Um, so they're trying to do something with what they had. Um, so here is a McDonald's cheeseburger as they actually look like, which uh, I'm putting up because the first article I saw that was critical of mindfulness in a meaningful way was also ironically in the Huffington Post, and it was called Beyond McMindfulness, where Ron Purser, who's a professor at San Francisco State University, was lamenting that this new secularized version of mindfulness is too divorced from the original Buddhist version for it to really improve people's lives or improve society. And so he's saying we need to reconnect with the Buddhist version um, in order for mindfulness to have a lot of the positive beneficial consequences people expect it to have, uh, and that many of their expectations are really based on the assumption that this current watered down version in his view um, is still closer to the Buddhist version than it really was. I think that's a little challenging because of the separation of church and state and laws preventing proselytizing the workplace and what have you. So I think there's a reason it was secularized, but that's his view. Um, so my colleague, Kathleen Vos and I started running studies. And what we did was we randomly assigned people again to either listen to the meditation or some control condition where they read the news or listen to mind wandering recording. And then we gave them a task to do. And these tasks were pretty uh, boring, not very interesting, kind of unpleasant. Like one of them was copying the text from the iTunes terms and conditions for two minutes or helping someone try to improve their cover letter so they could get a summer job. And so we told them what the task is gonna be. And then we asked them, how motivated are you to do this task? And then they rated their motivation. And then we actually had them do the task and we measured or we coded or we graded how well they performed on like one of these three or four different tasks. And if you read these listicles like in BuzzFeed about how mindfulness is good for everything, you'd assume that mindfulness increased motivation and also increased performance. And we got neither of those effects. Mindfulness reduced motivation and it did nothing at all to people's performance. So we were surprised that mindfulness um, didn't make them both go together in the same way. Usually motivation and performance are correlated with each other, like they go up or down together. Uh, so that's also something interesting here. But in any case, it went against people's assumptions. And we published it in this journal, Organizational Behavior and Human Decision Processes. But this is a scientific journal, and no one really reads scientific journals unless they really have to. Um, but because my co-author, Kathleen, is really a famous psychologist, she got us the opportunity to um, write an op-ed about our findings in the New York Times. And I thought this was a phenomenal um, opportunity to share our research, which it was. But I also learned a couple of things in the process. One, when you publish an article in a newspaper, you don't get to pick your title. So the title that the editors of the New York Times picked was, hey boss, you don't want your employees to meditate. So, I mean, the title I wanted was The Demotivating Power of Now, kind of a joke on words with the Eckhart Tolle book, The Power of Now. Um, but if you look at my research program, the, most of my research is, even though I'm sometimes finding some uh, evidence that mindfulness can backfire, which is arguably the case with this demotivation finding, uh, most of my research is still finding that mindfulness is helpful. And so I disagree with the idea that a boss should never want their employee to meditate. I think there are definitely situations where both the boss and the employee um, would benefit from people meditating in the workplace. Uh, second thing is that anyone can write anything in the comment section on a website. Uh, there were 295 comments by people who are all competing with each other to come up with more creative ways to say that this was the worst article anyone in the world has ever written. And Kathleen and I are the worst people who have ever lived. Um, I mean, you probably shouldn't read the comments, but I was new to this, so I did. Uh, and one of them by this person named T from Flyover Country said, Kathleen Vos and Andrew Haffenbrack are behavioral Mengeleists. Um, so as if this wasn't kind of enough. And I mean, what's ironic here is that mindfulness is about um, non-judgmental acceptance of the present moment. And then when you say something that's even mildly negative about mindfulness, people react in very reactive, very non-mindful ways. So, you know, don't criticize mindfulness because um, uh, people say they're mindful, but when push comes to shove, that's not always the case. Um, but what happened next was even more surprising, I think, because Richard Davidson, the neuroscientist, who's a big proponent of mindfulness, and Ariana Huffington, who founded the Huffington Post, they wrote an article criticizing my research um, 
that was called Don't Buy Into the Backlash, The Science of Meditation is Clear. And they um, spread it through various different online outlets, including Inc.com and their Thrive website that they started and a couple others. And so they said a number of things that I don't really agree with. One is they said one flawed study can't diminish the benefits of meditation in the workplace. First of all, we ran 15 studies for this article. So if we have flawed studies, we at least have 15 of them, not just one. Uh, secondly, they said that our findings were wrong because they go against another article. But the other article they cited had no data. It was just a theory paper. Um, and then they also said that the reason that this doesn't count is that it's just a 15 minute state mindfulness induction instead of an eight week program. You really need trait mindfulness in order to see benefits of mindfulness. But when I was saying something good about meditation four years ago with the decision making article, then you know 15 minutes of mindfulness was fine and it counted. So even though I think their logic is not very strong, it didn't really matter because their critical article was shared, it kind of went viral uh, it was shared by people like Deepak Chopra, who has 3.4 million Twitter followers. Um, Phil Jackson, the coach of the Lakers and Bulls, hadn't tweeted in six months. So he like, I think he crawled out of his, you know, six championship ring uh, trophy cabinet and tweeted about this. Uh, and then Ariana Huffington tweeted at me just to make sure I saw it. Um, so I think that I, I do believe that the overwhelming majority of these positive things we know about mindfulness are real. But the fact that people react so strongly to even a minor criticism of mindfulness um, worries me that there might be other negative effects we don't know about because if someone who's a researcher finds the effect, they just don't believe it because it goes against their worldview. And even if they do believe it, they're less likely to publish it because it goes against their agenda. Um, so th this was a big learning that I had through this process. Um, but I still, on the balance, think mindfulness is a very good thing and it's a very good tool for us to have. Because when you think about stress, there are kind of three steps to the process of stress. First, there are the bad things that happen to us in life or that might happen. Then there are psychological reactions to those things. And then there are the physiological reactions like fight or flight response or increased risk of heart disease. Um, and if you get to the last step, it's kind of too late. So you either want to minimize the stressors and bad things if you can, or avoid some of them, or you want to change the way you're reacting uh, before um, you get to the last stage where you have a heart attack. Um, and this, this first linkage between the bad things and how we react to them, that's often made worse by our tendencies to ruminate or catastrophize um, or you know just let ourselves wallow in self-pity. And mindfulness kind of weakens that first link. It makes it easier for us to notice and acknowledge and accept uh, some of the challenges in life and then kind of move on because we've made sense of them instead of avoiding or suppressing them uh, or ruminating and keep playing them over and over in a way that doesn't really help. Um, and it's also really helpful because it is the only break time activity that people have found in at least one study that's positively related to feeling energized. So even though when people meditate, it makes them calm and it kind of reduces their feelings of arousal or energy in the moment, it also, it's almost like a break or a mini nap um, that once you wake up from that meditation afterwards, you often have more energy to uh, channel into the next thing that you're going to do. So um, there are a lot of benefits still and a couple of the important ones for the workplace is that when a team of people is more mindful, they tend to have more functional ways of engaging in conflict. So there are two kinds of conflict. There's task conflict, like I disagree with how we should do this. And there's relational conflict, like you know I don't get along with that person or I don't like them. And sometimes if we disagree about a task, then it turns into relationship conflict. But when a team is more mindful, these two become less related. So you can argue more about the task without it becoming an interpersonal problem. And another paper, they also found that people don't avoid conflict as much, and they're also able to engage in it in a more collaborative way. So one other kind of minor caveat, though, that I want to mention, uh, there's this, what I think is a really insightful Harvard Business Review article written by a man named David Brendel, who is an executive coach and also a medical doctor. And I, I want to read this quote because I think it's pretty important. He says, I've worked with clients who, instead of rationally thinking through a career challenge or ethical dilemma, 
They prefer to disconnect from their challenges and retreat into a meditative mindset. The issue is that some problems require more thinking, not less. Sometimes stress is a signal that we need to consider our circumstances through greater self-reflective thought, not a mindful retreat to focus breathing or other sensory experiences. So I think that an interesting or an important part of this is that if mindfulness becomes our only coping mechanism or our default way of reacting to stress, we might shy away from engaging in, in trying to fix some problems that would be fixable if we tried. If our main way of dealing with any kind of stress in our life is we just accept it, then we're only dealing with the second stage of stress, not the first stage, which you know sometimes we could reduce or we could sidestep um, some of the stressors or problems in our life, and we should still be looking out for that. So thinking of mindfulness as a tool is, I think, really valuable. But thinking of it as the only tool or the default tool can be a little problematic. So a heuristic or a rule of thumb we could use is if I feel bad, um, what, is there something I should be learning from this negative feeling? Can I use it to perform better and become more competitive or like be a better person? Is this a sign that I should treat other people better? Um, so it, we wouldn't have negative emotions so often uh, if from a Darwinian evolution standpoint, they weren't helping us. So the fact that we have negative emotions means that it benefited all the people before us to have them. And this has been an adaptation that survived. Uh, but sometimes um, we, because the world we live in is very different from the people who came before us several, even hundred years ago. Uh, sometimes we're going to be ruminating too much or we're thinking about things too much. We are feeling the wrong forms of negative emotion. We're feeling too much of them. They're getting in the way. We're feeling too much stress to the point that it's just distracting us or giving us a panic attack. When this is happening, mindfulness is a really helpful tool for us to feel better and also in many cases perform better. Um, so just a few last things I wanted to mention um, related to the current uh, situations we're in in the world with coronavirus and this pandemic. Um, one of the really well-known models of motivation is Maslow's hierarchy. And the idea is that first you need to have your physiological needs like food, drink, uh, met, and then safety, like feeling like you're not going to be attacked, and the social needs where you're connected with other people, and then you start to think bigger picture where, okay, your self-esteem matters, and then you can think, okay, how do I contribute to the world in a meaningful way that um, can kind of manifest my skills or my passions into the world in a way that helps other people. So if you're worried about, you know, where where's the next meal going to come from, it's harder to think big picture is one of the main uh, takeaways from this. And right now, uh, coronavirus in some meaningful way is threatening pretty much all of the things at the bottom level of Maslow's hierarchy. So it's threatening our happiness, it's threatening our physical safety, it's threatening our ability to connect with other people at a social level, um, it's threatening you know, our physical bodies and if we do get infected. Um, and so it, it's not surprising that it's hard for us to focus right now on things that would normally be kind of easier to focus on because the bottom levels uh, of what we often need as a fundamental base are, are under attack. Um, and so one of the only, because the pandemic is so recent and it takes a while to publish research articles, we don't know too much specifically about it, but one of the articles that I did see come out so far, that's, it hasn't been published, but it's at least in paper form, they found that mindfulness reduces the impact of all of this COVID-related information on people's sleep. So mindfulness seems to be doing the things that we already know it does, but um, we need it more in this situation because a lot of the stress we often have, it's just dialed up to 11. Um, and so my colleague, Kathleen, who we did the demotivation paper together, we ran a survey on March 16th, which was the same day the New York City lockdown began. So it was, it was really an inflection point that was pretty stressful for at least the U.S. Uh, and it was a, a national U.S. sample on the Internet. And we had people meditate for 15 minutes. And what we found that was that it significantly reduced their anxiety and stress and it increased their calmness like it usually would. But there was no effect at all on their predictions of how severe is this pandemic going to be. So it made them feel better, but it didn't make them complacent. It didn't make them think, oh, there's no problem. It just probably helped them see reality um, and with a little bit more clarity, um, but still realizing that this is what right now is not a very good reality. Um, 
And so another benefit that we probably have, I mean, I, there aren't studies on this, but logically it would make sense that if you're used to being aware of your body because you're focusing on your breathing or you're focusing on a body scan, you're probably going to be more aware of where your hands are and you're probably less likely to kind of infect yourself by uh, touching your face when you shouldn't. Um, there's a lot of evidence that noticing our emotions is better and more functional for us than suppressing them. Um, and this is one of the main reasons that people go to therapy is that you're, you're sitting there talking to someone largely about your emotions and this is therapeutic, it's beneficial. Um, and it can help us notice how much we're ruminating and catastrophizing and worrying about things that might be even worse than, than the reasonable case scenarios. And with the sunk cost bias paper that I mentioned, the main point there is basically mindfulness helps us change our minds. So if we started out thinking this is a hoax or this is you know, not a serious problem and we realized, okay, well maybe it is a serious problem, mindfulness might be something that helps us take our ego out of it and admit, you know, actually I need to change my mind about this and I need to take it seriously. So that was the content that I wanted to talk about so far. And now I'd love to hear if you guys have any questions. All right. So the first question that we have is, can we please also talk about, and I apologize if I don't pronounce this correctly, Vipassana? I don't know. If Vipassana? That, that seems right. <laughs> so this, to my understanding, Vipassana is breath work. So it, they're pretty much the same word. It's the same thing going by different words. So breath meditation, which is often called Mindfulness, a form of mindfulness meditation, it's the most common form of mindfulness meditation that is the first meditation you do in various mindfulness programs like MBSR. It's the one you do every day repeatedly usually. It's the go-to thing people are told to do when they're feeling stressed. Um, this is also um, called Vipassana, but please correct me if I'm wrong uh, and there's more to it, um, whoever asked that question. Andy, can you talk a little bit about what sort of influence there is on the teacher in a guided meditation? Does it matter? Hmm. Well, as long as the person's voice puts you into a state of mindfulness. So if it's a, it, it, the more soothing their voice is and clear, the more effective it's going to be. So we started out borrowing this recording from a woman who wrote the, the landmark paper, the first person who ever did these 15 minute mindfulness studies. And we emailed her and asked for the recording she used in her previous paper. And we listened to it. And I just thought her voice was overly nasal. And I, I just thought this wouldn't put me in a state of mindfulness. Um, and that's why we re-recorded and we hired a different mindfulness coach who would do it. But I also didn't do it myself because um, I, I don't feel like I am good enough at that and that I would trust my own voice without the training of how to do it um, to be a, an actual mindfulness teacher that I'd be able to, um, to bring people into a meditation and into that state the way someone whose job is to do that would. Does that kind of get to your question or do you think? It does, it does indeed. Um, another one, Andy. Um, do we know how prevalent it is? I mean, you mentioned a number of organizations that, that are uh, introducing mindfulness meditation into the workplace, but do we have a sense of prevalence at this point in the United States? Well, it's, it's like 70% of Fortune 500 companies. So the bigger the company is, the more likely it is they're going to have it because they just have more offerings in general. Um, so, I mean, if you look at really small organizations or startups, they're probably less likely to have it because you know their focus is on getting to scale, um, and so it, there are a lot of. Even five years ago, they said that the amount of money spent was at least a billion, um, and now it's probably. I mean, I'd be surprised if it wasn't three billion per year in the U.S. alone. So it's become a really big industry. It's become a big. Um, like a go-to training program within organizations. And it can sometimes be a little bit problematic in the sense that if you're a company that doesn't treat your employees particularly well, but then you provide a mindfulness program 
almost as a band-aid over kind of a wound that needs stitches, um, that, that sometimes can happen. And that's one of the criticisms is like, may, if you're gonna have a mindfulness program, try to make sure you also ask yourself like, how might uh, the management's choices be contributing to stress um, rather than just thinking people should be accepting every stressor and meditating away. Great. Kristen, do you have others that are popping up? I do. Is there a length of time each day that is recommended for beginners? Mm, so based on my research, it takes, so eight minutes is often not enough to put you into a state of mindfulness compared to zero. Um, it, in, in one of the studies we ran, but it was only one study. So if I listen to an eight minute recording, I think it's probably enough. And it's also short enough that if you're new to it or you don't have a lot of time, it's probably doable without feeling like you had to invest a lot of time in it. Um, so people have gone shorter. I mean, if you read Search Inside Yourself, um, so I mean, I wanted to get to this slide too. Um, so Search Inside Yourself is this book by Chad Ming Tan, who started the mindfulness program at Google. And he talks about, you know, just take one mindful breath, take like one to three mindful breaths to give yourself a break. And part of why mindfulness can be helpful is that it interrupts the cycle of mind wandering or our internal monologue or a cycle of self-talk. Um, and it kind of can also make us feel like we're in control of it. Um, so part of the benefit is just kind of taking a break from that, even if it's very brief. But the, the bigger focus is on, you know, how does it, how do we use it if it's for a little bit longer to calm ourselves down in a more um, significant way? And my guess is that probably takes about eight, but 15 is a little more effective than eight and more reliable. But uh, if you're new to it, 15 might be a little bit on the long end. Um, it, I mean, it's probably about right, but I, I wouldn't start with like 45. Um, so I think building up to it is, is a good idea. Um, so I would go at the beginning with either eight or 15. All right, Andy, the next one for you. What do you think about meditation apps? Uh, and uh, which one would you uh, recommend if you do happen to think that they're a good choice? That's a great question. And the irony is that our smartphones are huge sources of distraction um, that take us out of mindfulness, but they can also be used uh, as a force for mindfulness. Um, and so the, by far, by far, by far, the best, um, uh, the most successful one uh, in terms of its market capitalization is the Headspace app that you've probably heard of before. Um, I mean, they have like 10 to 20 to 50 times more subscribers than probably the second best. So uh, that would be the go go to app if you are open to paying for a subscription where you're paying every month, um, the quality is very good. Um, if you don't want to pay for a subscription, there are a lot of free recordings of guided meditations that you can access. So uh, at the top of this slide, which I mean, feel free to take a screenshot um, or, or we can distribute the slides if that's possible. Uh, here's the eight minute version of the recording that I use in my studies. Here's the 15 minute version. It's just the same recording, just cut different lengths. And then here is the website freemindfulness.org. And um, so, and then sla front slash download, forward slash download. That's where you can find probably like 50 different um, recordings that you can download for free. So, I mean, you could pretty much build your own mindfulness uh, course just by listening to the free materials on a systematic basis. Um, you could also buy John Kabat-Zinn's CDs, which some of those are really like 45 minutes long, but that would also even more closely approximate what you would get in a real life face-to-face -face MBSR program, which is harder now that you know we can't leave our houses for the pandemic. Um, but there's also going to be a paid group session through UW that last I heard like last week wasn't at capacity yet. So if, if you wanna do something that's through UW, that would be like, at least a live mindfulness coach you could talk to, not just a recording, that would be a good option as well. Do you have any resources for managers who want to introduce mindfulness to their employees? I think that all these same resources would be useful, but it's important as a manager 
not to make it seem like it's something that they have to do. And this is partly because it comes from religion. So there's a little bit of a more of a risk that it's going to look like you're proselytizing or because it should really be a personal practice and it's something that people should really buy into or be interested in their, themselves. So having a very light touch, you know, here's something that I think has been interesting and been helpful. If you'd like to give it a try, if not, you know, I'm, I'm not going to mention it again. Um, that could be good. Um, I don't think that there's an Office of Potential Project in Seattle, um, but reaching out to them to see if they have any suggestions um, or, I mean, I don't know if they would fly people in or something, but I mean, that's probably pretty expensive. Um, but Search Inside Yourself also, they have spun off into their own kind of organization where they now do mindfulness trainings for other companies. So for example, Ford hired Search Inside Yourself, which had been created at Google to also do mindfulness programs at Ford. Um, so that would be one option, um, but also, reading a little bit about uh, mindfulness. So especially this book, Mindful Work, that gives you a really good idea of how mindfulness has been implemented in businesses. And it will probably also give you some uh, leads of who could you contact to, to try to make a mindfulness program at your company. All right, um, here's a compliment and a follow-up question, Andy. Uh, somebody wrote in, well done, very balanced take. Maybe I missed this, but on the whole, do you think the benefits outweigh the drawbacks or vice versa? Yes, I do think the benefits outweigh the drawbacks. Um, I think that if we, if we use the analogy of like popping a pill when we have a headache, I mean, we don't pretend that Tylenol has no side effects. We figure out what the side effects are and we're honest with people. Okay, here are the costs and here are the benefits and you can make a decision of whether it's right for you. So. Uh, what worries me about like the state of mindfulness research is that people are almost afraid to mention that there could ever be any drawbacks or that there could ever be any um, kind of even minor negative effects of it. And I just think it's dishonest, but overall there are probably 3000 articles on the benefits of mindfulness and maybe there are three on the drawbacks. And that could be a little bit of a publication bias, but I don't think it's all publication bias. I think there is something about our mental life right now in, you know, 2020 with our smartphones and 24 hour news networks and, um, you know, notifications popping up in the corner of our screen from Outlook. And we're just not able, uh, we're not in an environment that helps us uh, focus on one thing at a time and be calm and, um, I think that mindfulness is a great way to counteract some of the challenges of our current environment. Andy, I did want to point out somebody mentioned the Healthy Minds app as oh. being free and something that they've enjoyed. I'd also throw out, I've uh, been a big fan of 10% Happier because right. I really like the uh, a variety of people that they have uh, as teachers on the on the app. Great. And I think there's one more called Calm. So definitely right. check these out. Thanks All right, Kristen, anything else or should I wrap things up? All right, we're gonna call it, uh, call it done. Um, let me uh, close by saying, Andy, thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your expertise. Uh, fascinating topic, I can't wait to see how it continues uh, and the different uh, ways that people uh, look into uh, mindfulness meditation. Kristen, thanks for the work behind the scenes. Uh, keep your eye out for more on Foster's LinkedIn page and blog. Uh, have a great weekend, everyone. Go dogs. <laughs>